Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Brainy Boomer Lecture Series. We're so very happy that you joined us all today. In 2007, the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging, or the MCSH Education Committee, started the Brainy Boomer Lecture Series in order to suggest practical steps to both improve and maintain brain health, as well as to promote healthy lifestyle choices amongst the most populous generation in history. The MCSA's Education Committee, which was founded in 1996, has three main objectives. Identifying education needs of healthcare providers, seniors, caregivers, and the public, and to develop responses to meet some of their needs. To enhance the positive image of the aging process by addressing stereotypes and myths about aging. And finally, the dissemination of research on aging. Our presenters today are Katie Lee and Timothy Leon. Katie is a McGill fourth year dietetic student who is passionate about cooking and food. And despite not yet being an expert in cooking, she loves sharing food and stories with others. Timothy is also a fourth year student at McGill University where he is pursuing his degree in dietetics. He is passionate about the role of food and nutrition in living, in, in living a happy life and healthy life. Before continuing, we would like to remind you to please mute your microphone on Zoom. And that if you have any questions, you can write them down in the chat box or you can wait until the end of the event um, to ask them. Now I'd like to invite Katie and Timothy to start their presentation, sharing autumn's bounty, preserving the flavors of fall. Hi everyone, my name is Katie, one of the two presenters today, and my partner is Tim. Okay, so it is the harvest season now. And if you go to a local farmer's market, you'll see so much fresh seasonal products. Uh, we do want to keep the flavor of fall for longer. And that's why we want to do a preservation workshop today. So what is food preservation? It is to preserve food by preventing or decreasing the growth of harmful microorganisms. They would change the color, texture, and flavor of the food. And this is so-called spoilage. Many factors would interfere with bacterial growth, such as temperature, oxygen, water content of the food, and acidity. So correspondingly, decreasing the temperature to inhibit growth, heating to raise the temperature and kill microorganisms, isolating food from oxygen and reducing water contents in the food and introducing acids to the environment are all good ways to preserve food. So food begins to spoil the moment it is harvested and food preservation enable our ancient ancestors to make roots and live in one place to form a community. There's no need to harvest immediately, but they could preserve some for later use. And each culture preserved their local food resources using the same basic methods of food preservation. So first I'd like to ask everyone a question. Feel free to pull out your chat box and uh, type down your answer. How, uh, how familiar are you with food preservation? And if you are to reach yourself with zero being, I know nothing about food preservation and 10 being, I'm an expert. I am super comfortable with preserving food and I know a lot of techniques. Well, the answers are- Sixes <laughs> and sevens. So some people who are pretty familiar with uh, <laughs> preservation techniques and we see somewhat. We got a zero that just came in, so you're going to learn a lot today, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this, this is great. And we seem to have like... a really wide range of uh, skills <laughs> and interests in this topic. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So just like harvesting, food preservation is not just an individual activity. It's an excellent chance to get other members of the family involved and have fun. Think about cracking open a jar of jam several months after you preserved it and the beautiful colors, the sweetness of the fruits, they're still present. Um, have you ever done any preservation with family or friends before? Would you like to share with us? Uh, feel yeah, free so to open up your mic. Exactly. So maybe I can get us started off. Um, I quite enjoy food preservation, but like Katie was saying, um, it's a little bit more of a group effort. <laughs> I've never done it by <laughs> myself. Um, so the main things that we do, we do, um, we make pickles, uh, we can tomatoes, and we also make jam. Um, and it's definitely a big family production line. It's definitely a lot more fun that way. And it's a lot easier that way as well. And how many people are we talking about that get involved in this process? We're a big family. <laughs> We're a big family, <laughs> yeah. All the cousins, everything, yeah. 
<laughs> Anyone else have anything they'd like to share? If not, we, you can feel free to leave it in the chat as well. Or we're just going to keep going with the presentation. Okay, let's keep going. So for today's workshop, we're going to start off by talking about um, briefly about the history of food preservation. And then we're going to go on and cover all the different types of food preservation um, that are out there in modern times. And then we're going to demonstrate three recipes um, that all use, that all showcase a different food preservation technique. So starting with fermentation, we're going to show how to make a sauerkraut. And then with water bath canning, we're going to make a classic autumn jam. And then we're going to demonstrate, we're going to talk about the process of preserving food by drying. And we're going to demonstrate how to make apple chips for that. And then at the end of the presentation, there'll be time for questions. Okay. Any time to eat those things, what you make? <laughs> <laughs> if you make them at home, you'll get to eat some. <laughs> okay. Okay, so <laughs> I'd like to start us off by asking you guys, you know, why do we preserve food? What makes food preservation such an interesting or imp important topic to you guys? Why should we care about preserving food? And so just feel free to type in the chat box um, what you guys think. And Katie's going to keep an eye out on, on, on the different comments you guys leave while I carry on with uh, the slide. Um, so one of the most important reasons we preserve food um, that we, we kind of don't think about nowadays is that for our ancient ancestors, it was necessary in order to survive periods of scarcity. And actually, this was key for allowing the shift from our nomadic hunter-gatherer lifestyle to um, where we kind of rotated across the land, wherever the prey went to get food, into finally settling down and putting down roots and creating um, civilization. And one of the reasons for that is because the agricultural revolution, the reason it was so um, important and the reason why it was so effective is because it got coupled with food preservation techniques. Agriculture is only useful in the presence of food preservation because you can make all these crops and have this massive surplus of food, but what good is it going to be if it's all going to spoil and go to waste? With food preservation, though, we're able to convert all that surplus of food into a stockpile of food and resources so that when there's a famine or a period of scarcity, we've planned for the future. We've invested now into the future. And so because food preservation has played such an instrumental role um, throughout human history and changed the course of human evolution forever, it's no wonder then that past and present in cultures all across the world, there is a rich history and story of food preservation and different um, recipes that use preserved foods. So I'm just going to take a, mom um, a moment in the following slides to, to dive a little bit into the stories um, of food preservation, because I think understanding the importance of food preservation to our ancient ancestors really sets the stage for understanding um, why preserving food is important to us now culturally and socially. And so let's see uh, what you guys have in the chat. Yeah, we have so many great answers and a lot of audience are saying they had experience with food preservation before. Some have made jam, some have made kimchi and they have all the great answers for reasons of food preservation. And some are saying, like there's less chemicals in the um, in the natural, the one that you would made yourself at home. And some are saying you cannot have the food grown all year round. That is exactly the reason why. And wow, I see Janine even made uh, kimchi a few months ago. So we got some fermentation experts in the chat. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to cover, I'm going to showcase three different techniques that I think really have an interesting story and tell us a lot about who we are as humans and where we come from. And so we're going to start with cooling. Um, so, you know, as we all know, if we cool down food, it's going to last for a lot longer. And our ancient ancestors knew that very well. And so the hunter gatherers, um, they would hunt their prey and they would butcher the meat. And then the, what they do with the fresh meat was they would submerge it underneath cold water. So in a cold running stream, or like in the picture on your left, you see a cold pond. Um, or they can bury it under snow and ice, or they can store it in cool caves. And this was actually an, a crucial piece of their subsistence strategy, and it allowed them to survive, um, especially during the period of transition between winter and springtime. And then fast forward to when we finally built settlements and, we're, um, we're get, um, and we've had the innovation of housing, um, we, we learned that things were much cooler underground. So we dug holes, and we put a roof over, and we got root cellars. And it was innovations like this that really allowed the agricultural revolution to flourish. 
um, because as I mentioned, all that surplus and extra crops, we now have a place to store them so that when a famine hits or when there's a period of scarcity or we don't have enough crops, um, we have food ready and, the, and humans can continue to survive. And then fast forward today, we have modern refrigeration. This is a remarkable innovation, a remarkable piece of technology. And what I think makes it even more remarkable is how widespread it is and how much we take it for granted. We don't even notice that, you know, every single one of us in this, in this Zoom call has a fridge um, some, um, somewhere in their homes. You know, imagine how much more difficult life would be without um, well, refrigeration, how much less fresh produce you'd be able to eat. It's like having miniature, a miniaturized version of winter sitting somewhere in your home all throughout the year, and you can just put anything in there and it's all of a sudden you've extended the life of your food. Um, so this is really remarkable and we see how far we've come from having to bury stuff underwater to modern refrigeration. And so we can talk about the next technique now, um, which is salting. If you can move to the next slide. And so this one's also really quite interesting. On the left is a depiction of the large salt deposits you would find in ancient Mesopotamia. If you don't know ge geographically where that would be in modern terms, um, that's like in the Middle East. So think uh, Iran, Turkey, Syria. So in that area would have been where ancient Mes Mesopotamia is. And with all these large salt deposits there, it's no wonder that these were the first people to come into contact with the method of food of preserving food by salting. And so people noticed that when you salt something like fresh meat, it would draw the moisture out and then that meat all of a sudden would last a much longer time. And so this knowledge spread from ancient Mesopotamia over to the Mediterranean and it was there that the Romans learned from the Greeks about salting food and Romans, they were in love with the idea of salting food. They love putting salt on everything and they loved cured meats. And just to exemplify this, on the right is a picture of this ancient Roman garum factory. And what garum is, is a, it's a salted fish product. So they literally have these massive factories and buildings just to produce this single um, salted product. And that just shows how much they love that. And in fact, salt was so important, it was used as a form of currency. And we see remnants of that today still in the English language. So the word salary, well, the root for the Latin root for that word is salarium, which means salt. And so in the ancient Roman times, people were literally paid their wages in salt. And that still exists in the English language um, today. Um, and fast forward to modern times, you can see how the how the Romans have, you know, influenced all of Europe to love their cured meats. So think, think about in modern times, we have prosciutto and salami or charcuterie. So these things are still very much with us and that's thanks to the Romans. Um, we can go to the next slide now. And then finally, the last technique I would like to talk about briefly is, is drying. And so um, it was thought to have originated this technique um, in the Middle Eastern cultures or the Oriental cultures. And they've been doing this for at least 14,000 years. And no wonder they have a lot of sun there and a lot of fruit to dry. And you can see how how this abundance of, of, of fruit and, and, and their knowledge of the drying technique still exists today. If you go to the Middle East, go to a bazaar in Turkey, for example, you'll still, and, and you go to these big massive stalls, you'll see them filled with mountains of fruit, of dried fruit, you know, half of which I don't even recognize, all these exotic products. So clearly they have a long and storied history with dried fruits. And so I hope by now we're starting to pick up on the fact that preserved foods um, are very much a reflection of the geography, the culture, the climate, what local foods were available, the religion, the history, and the story of the peoples that used them. And just a few more examples to really drive home that point. Um, in the top middle, you have an ancient Mesopotamian temple called the Ziggurat, and people would give, the ancient people would offer up dried fruits as religious offerings. And similarly, in the bottom middle um, picture, you have a depiction of um, the, the Egyptians offering once again dried fruits as funerary offerings in their tombs. And so the ancient Mesopotamias and ancient Egyptians have clearly ascribed religious significance and cultural significance to preserved foods. And then at the top right is a, is a very typical stew you would find in Tunisia or Morocco. It's meat stewed with dried fruits and different fruits. And I think that's very curious and interesting because it illustrates that you know, they had an abundance of dried fruits there and they're looking for different ways to use it. If you look elsewhere, 
And we look in Europe, for example, the stews tend to be savory, but here in Tunisia and Morocco, they, it's very common to have sweet and savory, savory intermingling together. And it tells a lot about their history with dried fruits. And then finally on the bottom right, um, it's just a raisin bread that you would find in ancient Rome. And, and so um, raisins were, this was a preferred breakfast of the ancient Romans. Um, and in fact, raisins were super important to them. Similar to salt, it was used as a form of currency. And so over, so when I told the story of these three different preservation techniques, I hope we pick up on the fact that preserving food has evolved from merely a means of survival and necessity and now it's something that's cultural and social. So we've evolved from needing to preserve food to we'd like to preserve food. And I think what really exemplifies this is last year, the year 2020, there was actually a home canning equipment shortage. And so ve that very much shows that people are very much in tune with the social and cultural aspects of food preservation. They want to get back in touch with that um, aspect of food. Now Tim has talked about how the past and the brilliant history evolves. And let's look at some modern reasons for food preservation. And the first one is to keep at its best quality. Food deteriorates over time due to spoilage. And in many cases, those spoilage does not make food unsafe to eat, but it significantly affects the taste, texture, and the appearance. Proper food preservation can help retain some of these qualities as well as non-nutrition values of certain food. And also, food in long-term storage is at risk of spoilage due to bacteria such as E. coli, salmonella, and other pathogens. Bacteria only need warmth, moisture, and time to rapidly multiply in the food, but food preservation inhibits one or more of these conditions to minimize the pathogenic bacteria. And last but not least is the financial reason. Prolonging the shelf life of food would help reduce waste. So this is saving your pocket as well as storing more food for the winter. So now we know why we're doing this. Let's check out how we can do this. There are many ways of food preservation and I just have a few of them listed here. Food fermentation, this one, it is um, when yeast and microorganism converts carb into alcohol or acids. Uh, alcohol and acids have the preservative effect. And one of the demonstration today is to use fermentation to make sauerkraut. And because fermentation involves acidity and microbes pre-digesting the food, the flavor profile and texture changes. Fermentation helps create chocolate, cheese, yogurt, kombucha, sauerkraut, sourdough bread, and vinegar. And when it comes to homemade canning, we must talk about mason jars. And during the canning process, high temperature created by the water bath is really the key to sterilize the jars. The jars will be placed on the jar rack in the pot so that they are converted, uh, they are covered with one inch of water at least. And it is usually used to can high acidic foods like fruits, jam, jellies, tomatoes, etc. And then it's drying. Drying is the process of reducing water content in the food. There is sun drying air, and air drying techniques. And with the development of technology to dry food, we now have food dehydrators and ovens. And then it's sugaring, as well as salting would draw the water content out of the food. And with less water, less microbe would be able to grow. And last but not least, freezing. This is probably the most friendly technique to beginners. Before freezing, most vegetables would need to be blanched or cooked to inactivate the enzymes inside. Vegetables that are suitable for freezing include broccoli, cauliflower, corn, peas, uh, squash, kale, etc. And before we get into any technique, we have to say we don't want you to get sick from eating improperly preserved food. So here are some basic ground rules for food safety. First, always start by washing your hands to avoid any potential contamination. Also make sure the tools and equipment you're using are clean and dry. And for cutting, remember to use a clean cutting board and a sharp knife and be careful not to hurt yourself. I personally had so much experience with cutting my fingers by accident. And during cutting, you had to curl the hand holding the food like this and chop or cut like this. So 
Before we start the part for fermentation and probiotic, I just want you to ask a little question. What fermented food do you enjoy? Feel free to type your answer in the chat box. Mm -hmm. So while the answers are coming in, I would just say, usually the quantity of fermented food is much more than one serving. And this is a good way of sharing with your family, friends, and other members of the community. You get to enjoy the work done together if you did the fermentation as a group. And this is quite a sense of accomplishment. Tim, would you mind reading some answers? Yeah, we got kimchi, box? sauerkraut, sauerkraut, so a lot of fermented veggies. We're going to do a sauerkraut workshop today. So hopefully you can learn something new if you already know how to make sauerkraut. <laughs> <laughs> or if you don't and you enjoy it, maybe now you can make your own. We see beer, wine, classics. I love those. <laughs> don't we Same. all? Idlis. I, that's something I, I'm not familiar with. <laughs> maybe someone needs to teach me what that is. That's interesting. Yeah, let's check well, out A lot the of list. fermented cabbage lovers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is being, uh, to Rosie, yes, this is being recorded. So... Um, all the slides and the recipes um, are all going to be accessible to you after this presentation, and it's also all recorded. Um, so don't worry about frantically taking notes or anything. You're going to get all of this afterwards. Okay, you have so many great answers. And I have a list here, but it's not exotic. We have beer, wine, vinegar, and like chocolate, hot sauce, sauerkraut, kimchi, etc. So many fermented foods. All right, so it's, it's clear that our chat loves all kinds of fermented foods, um, but how does fermentation actually work? And so I'm gonna talk specifically about lactic acid fermentation because that's the fermentation that we're gonna to use to make sauerkraut today. And so on the left, you have your raw cabbage. And so on the leaves, on the surface of the leaves of the cabbage, there's actually all of these little lactic acid bacteria. And these bacteria can feed on the sugars that are naturally present inside of the cabbage and under the correct conditions, they'll grow and ferment. And so what the conditions are is you have to have, have, to have the right temperature. And in this case, it would be room temperature. There can't be any oxygen. Um, there has to be the right concentration of salts. And that actually has another effect where it inhibits harmful bacteria from growing on your, on your cabbage. And then you have to allow it enough time. And a quality sauerkraut usually would take one to three weeks to ferment. And so if the conditions are right, then the last lactic acid bacteria are gonna feed on the sugars that are naturally present in the cabbage and they're gonna to start to grow and multiply. And so you get a lot of different uh, probiotic bacteria that are present in your sauerkraut. And, and this preserves food in two, um, two ways. The first way is because there's so many of these bacteria, they actually form this kind of shield um, on, your, on, on the cabbage and that prevents other kinds of, and there's basically so much of this bacteria that other harmful bacteria have a hard time um, being able to grow on, on the surface of the a vegetable because it's already being inhabited by all of these good probiotic bacteria. And the other method is these bacteria produce a lot of their own acid. They produce lactic acid. And the acid itself is gonna preserve the cabbage and extend the life and protect it from other um, organisms from, from, from growing. Um, so we're gonna move on. And so you might've heard about sauerkraut being a probiotic food, or you might've heard a lot on the media about different probiotic foods. So what are probiotic foods? Um, they're just foods that contain live microbes. So the so-called good bacteria. So, that, so as we know, there's, uh, there's, for example, we have kombucha, yogurt, fermented pickles, kimchi, miso, and, and sa obviously sauerkraut. And then when you ingest these probiotic foods that contain these live microbes, they're going to go into your cut and gut and they're going to populate it. And that's been associated with a lot of different health benefits. Um, for, uh, for example, it's known to support immune function, reduce inflammation. It, has a, it can improve digestion and also plays an important role in enhancing mood and cognition. And so it's important that we incorporate these probiotic foods in our diet to support um, our health. And I think there was a question in the comments in the chat box. Is there any connection between lactic acid and lactose intolerance? Um, as far as I know, uh, I do not know of any connection. I don't know. I've never heard of this, of if you eat the acid, it'll improve your intolerance or, or anything like that. Lactose is very much a sugar molecule and lactic acid is a type of acid. 
Um, the two may have similar names, but they're 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 unrelated um, for the uh, for the purposes of, of fermentation and, and so on and so forth. Um, okay, so now that we're all fermentation experts and we know how it works, uh, uh, we're in a good place to to demonstrate how to make a classic simple sauerkraut. And, and just a little reminder, there's no need to take notes, just follow along. Everything and all the resources here will be emailed to you. And so it's very simple. The, for equipment, we just have a knife and a cutting board, a large mixing bowl, and then a glass jar for you to store the sauerkraut. Ingredients are two, cabbage and salt. It doesn't really matter what cabbage you use. You know, it's cabbage season, the farmer's market, just go out, whatever looks interesting, um, or cool or it excites you, give it a shot. It's going to work. You're going to be able to make sauerkraut or just use whatever you, whatever cabbage you happen to have at home. As far as salt goes, some people split hairs about, you know, using a specific kind of salt or really, really high quality salt. For the purposes of making sauerkraut, I'm here to tell you it really doesn't matter. Use any kind of salt that you have on hand. It's going to work. Or just use whatever salt you, pref you personally prefer. Um, and then just there's one ground rule for food safety. Um, to maximize your chance of making the sauerkraut and minimize the chances of any kind of contamination that might interfere with the process or might cause your food to go bad. Just make sure all your equipment and your hands are clean, especially right before you manipulate cabbage. As long as you follow this one rule, you're definitely gonna be able to make sauerkraut. This is a foolproof recipe. All right, so now we're gonna demonstrate how to make sauerkraut. Just a little warning, the video is gonna go a little fast, but um, you're gonna get the slides later. Um, so the first step is just to save the outer leaves and that's, that's a nifty trick. I'll show you what, uh, what to use that for at the end of the video. And then you wanna shred up the cabbage. And I find the easiest way is to just cut through the stem, leaving the stem intact, and that'll hold all the leaves in place so then you can just shred through the cabbage. Alternatively, if you happen to have a food processor, that will make your life a million times easier. So just use that instead. And so here we go, we're chopping away. And then you're gonna put it all in a large mixing bowl and you're gonna add some salt to it. Of course, make sure your hands are clean for this step. And then you're gonna massage it. And this process is gonna take about 10 to 15 minutes. You're trying to break down the cabbage, draw out that liquid and to create its own brine. And because it's, there's a lot of manual labor involved, this is a good opportunity to get a friend involved. So, you know, make it in a social event, have some fun with it, get the whole family involved. And then after um, you see the cabbage has gone limp and you see like some liquid coming out, just like you see in the video, then you're ready to put it in a jar. This should only take about 15 minutes. And so you're gonna put all your, your cabbage in a jar and make sure you pack it tightly and it's submerged in a liquid. And that's where the leaves are gonna come in handy because you can use that to push everything underneath the water, underneath the brine. And then there you have it. It's really simple, it's ready to ferment. Um, just remember to date and uh, name it. Um, and usually the fermentation will happen at room temperature for about at least five days. And you just taste it and you'll know when it's ready based on if you like the taste or not. Okay, and I see that Kathleen has sent the recipe to the chat, so be sure to check that. Oops, sorry. Okay, let's move on. So that's the entire preparation process, and now we would just let it ferment at room temperature, which is around 18 to 24 degrees Celsius. And if a room is warmer than the typical room temperature, you can expect the fermentation to go at a mass uh, at a much faster pace, and it would usually take around five to fourteen days. We can start to taste it after five days, but you can ferment it for longer. Uh, more than fourteen days is okay, and once it reaches the desirable flavor, refrigerate it to stop the fermentation. And because as Tim said, the lactic acid bacteria is breaking down the carb into acids and carbon dioxide. We have to burp the jar regularly, at least daily to let the gas escape. And because of the gas formation, it's normal to see bubbles or foam on the top and white scum. Um, the jar should be kept away from direct sunlight at a cool temperature for two months. And you can also just refrigerate it for six months. How do you know if the sauerkraut is not safe to eat? Um, check for strong rotting odors or any discoloration, like if there's anything greenish or bluish forming on top of the jar, that is mold. You had to uh, discard everything in the jar. And here's the comparison 
between our delicious homemade sauerkraut with a commercially made sauerkraut. And before we make any comparison, the first thing we need to check is the serving size of the two products. If they're different, we had to do some math to compare the nutrition values below. So as you can see here, it's uh, a quarter cup for both. And as you can see from the numbers below, the two products have very similar values. The, the sodium really stands out because we added a good amount of salt in the demonstration. This is significant because it's just a quarter cup of sauerkraut. And that's why sauerkraut should only be consumed in moderation. And a big portion of the sodium are actually in the liquid. So the brine of the sauerkraut should not be consumed. And to read those nutrition facts table, you have to check uh, for the notes here. So less than 5% of the daily value is a little, and more than 15% of the daily value is a lot. So this is like in the middle, it's 9%. And although the nutrition values for the two products are similar, we still recommend you to try the homemade sauerkraut over the commercial one. Uh, the commercially made sauerkraut costs more than double the amount of money than the homemade ones. And as Tim, Tim mentions, there is the healthy microbiome that is good for your gut in the homemade sauerkraut. But the commercial one does not necessarily have it because they might have been pasteurized or just pickled rather than being fermented. Yep, so there's, I, hear, I see some questions in the chat box. And so Janine asks, when we buy sauerkraut, it tastes like vinegar, do they add it? Um, so it depends on, on the company. And so some of them, some of them they do just, it's just cabbage and vinegar and that's why it tastes acidic. There's actually no fermentation. So then that's, so you don't get the probiotic bacteria in that. Um, some of them, they ferment it, but then they pasteurize the whole thing. So all the bacteria are dead and it's not a probiotic food anymore. So you have to read the label and see how they make it. If you're going to buy a store-bought one, it, it should just be fermented and not and non-pasteurized. If you want uh, a sauerkraut that actually contains probiotics and, um, and, didn't, and didn't just you know, add vinegar to it or didn't pasteurize it and kill everything off in it. And why does commercial sauerkraut last so long? Um, that could also be due to the canning technique. So after they make it and pasteurize it, um, they have an airtight vacuum seal on, on the lid. And then, then the shelf life is, is virtually infinite <laughs> or not infinite, but like years and years, um, especially since it's an acid as well. But homemade sauerkraut, you're just gonna ferment it and then leave it in the fridge. And so in the fridge, it can last a couple of months, but, um, but beca because it's not actually pasteurized and canned and sealed and airtight, um, it won't have that kind of shelf life. And later, Tim will show you how to um, do the home canning process yourself, and it can extend the shelf life of products as well. So sauerkraut, go back to sauerkraut. Sauerkraut can be served in many meals. You can have it as a side dish to add some zinc to the meals. You can make a fresh carrot slaw with it. So this includes grated carrots, chopped parsley, sauerkraut, and toasted nuts. You can adjust your recipe based on your preference, but just be careful not to use too much sauerkraut due to its sodium content. It can also be appealing to tuna, egg, chicken, and potato salad. And if you're sick of salad, it can also be used to brighten up the fish and shrimp tacos. It could be a combination of tomatoes, onions, avocados, cilantro, cheese, fish, shrimp, sauce, and or delicious sauerkraut. And if you're looking for something vegetarian, you can make a chip, uh, chickpea and sauerkraut wrap. It's a perfect on-the-go meal and it's good for your gut. You can use chickpea, spinach, diced tomatoes, celery, tahini sauce, and sauerkraut. The links to the recipe are here. So if you're interested, you can check them out later. All right, so enough about sauerkraut. We're gonna move on <laughs> to the next technique. Um, that's water bath canning. Um, this is the ideal food preservation technique to preserve high acid foods or foods with added acid. And so think fruits, jams, marmalades, any kind of tomato products that doesn't have meat in them like tomato sauces and salsa, and then pickled foods. So foods where you've added extra acid. And the reason I keep emphasizing acid, acid, acid is because it's a combination of both heat and acid 
that is required to destroy the microbes and enzymes in the food that is responsible for causing spoilage. And so if you're missing one of these two key elements, the acid, then you're putting yourself at risk of foodborne illnesses and food poisoning like botulism. And then the other thing is that during the canning process, air gets driven out of the jar and that creates a vacuum and an airtight seal. So basically in summary, the way this works is you have your jar of high acid food and then you boil it to kill everything that's inside, all the, all the harmful organisms that are inside it. And then you create a vacuum seal so that nothing can come in. And so that's how water bath canning works. And this is a really easy method to use at home to can your own food. And so I'm gonna break down step-by-step step how you can do this. And so the first step is to wash everything. Wash the jars, the snap lids, and the screw bands. If you don't know what these parts are, I've included a diagram and I've labeled it for you to look at. Um, and then you wanna sterilize the jars underneath boiling water for at least 10 minutes. And then once your high acid food is ready to be jarred, then five minutes immediately before you're gonna start filling the jars, you're gonna boil the snap lids for five minutes. And that is to activate the sealing compound, which is basically the glue underneath the lid. That's, that's really important for creating a good airtight vacuum seal. Next slide. Uh, and so now that everything's clean, you can fill your jars with your high acid food. And if you look at the picture on the left, you'll see they're using a funnel to help um, get the food in. If you have a funnel, excellent. Please use it. It'll make your life so much easier. But if you don't, don't worry about it. You can just use a ladle and scoop normally um, into the jar. Just make sure you take a clean damp cloth and wipe around the jar rims after you're done that because the food residue will interfere, interfere with a proper seal. Um, so just really make sure you do that. And also another thing to be um, to, to be cognizant of, cognizant of is to leave a quarter inch headspace um, when you fill the jars. And if you don't know what that is, the diagram on the right will show it. That's the level, um, that's the area from the top of the, of the food all the way to the lid. And uh, sorry, we have a question in the chat. Can you sterilize the jars in an oven? And if so, at one, what temperature? Um, you can sterilize the jars in an oven. Um, but that will, the one disadvantage of that is that it could heat the jars unevenly. So the risk of the glass breaking during this is going to be higher. As for the temperature, I really need to get back to you on that. I don't have it memorized off the top of my head. Um, but there's, there's a lot of the, the resources that we're going to share at the end of the, at the end of the presentation, they have um, information that um, from the USDA that, that, that covers all the food safety um, things such as a temperature, you have to sterilize the jars in the oven. And, and oven sterilization is one of the techniques that's covered um, and that website as well. Um, so I'd recommend that you just visit that resource um, to make sure you have the correct temperature and time for sterilizing the jars in the oven. Um, yep, so just make sure there's enough headspace. If there's too much, um, then there's a lot of air in the jar and that can increase your risk of contamination. If there's too little, then during the canning process, the liquid might boil out and then that'll mess with your seal and um, that's gonna be a, a risk for improper canning and contamination. Okay, so once your jars are filled, you can place the snap lids on top of the jar and then screw on the band just until fingertip tight. What that means is you're gonna keep twisting the screw band and then the moment you feel any amount of resistance, you stop and then that's it, it's ready to be um, it's ready to be canned. And so now you're gonna fill, you're gonna put your filled jars into a deep pot of boiling water and you're gonna let it boil for 10 minutes. Make sure it's submerged at least one inch under water um, for this to work properly. And then, so once the canning process is complete, you're going to take, you're gonna carefully remove them from the boiling water and let them cool on a rack or a clean towel. Be careful to avoid just putting it directly on a, on a, on a cold surface, because that's going to create glass, um, that's going to increase your risk of glass breaking. And also, um, don't put it next to a draft blowing in, because that's also going to um, break the glass. And then after it's cooled down, you're going to check the seal after 24 hours. So basically, just tap the top of the lid. It should, it shouldn't give away, it should just be, it should stay flat and stiff, and it shouldn't make any kind of popping noise. If the, if, 
the seal is imperfect and it didn't can properly, it, it'll be kind of bulging out like this. And when you click down on it, it'll make like a popping sound. It'll sound like, like something like that. And that means it's not done properly. And you're going to have to repeat um, the, the, the canning step um, with a new lid. Okay, are there questions in the chat? Okay, so it's saying, can you sterilize jars? In, oh, sorry. What about oh, using a pressure cooking for canning? And does the food have to be entered liquid? Um, so if you're going to use a water bath technique, then definitely the food has to be um, one inch underneath the liquid. That just for that makes the canning process a lot uh, more safe. I mean, some people get away with just rotating the, the jar inside the, the, the water. Um, to make sure all the, the places are covered in water at one point during the canning process. We don't recommend that, although we know some people <laughs> try to get away with that. And, and yeah, we do not recommend using a pressure cooker for the water bath canning technique. And an audience is saying I have made jelly without putting the jars under water. Um, yeah, so as I described, some people do get away with that. Some uh, the proper seal would form. It's not something uh, we would recommend, um, but <laughs> it's definitely a possibility. <laughs> yeah, and we can talk about jelly in, in the later slides. All right, so now that we know how to do the water bath canning technique, we're going to put it into practice um, by, make, by canning an autumn jam. So this is a very classic recipe. Um, on the left is all the equipment. So we need peeler knife cutting board, a large saucepan for you to boil the jam, and then a large pot and canning rack um, to do the canning process. And then you want some mason jars to store it. You can use three of the larger mason jars or maybe six smaller mason jars if you want to have more jam to share with friends and family. And then for the ingredients, you got apple, pears, and plums. So your triumvirate of, of fall fruit. Um, and then also lemon and sugar. You might notice in this recipe that is a lot of sugar. Five cups of sugar is quite a bit. For the sake of this jam recipe and for any jam recipe uh, for that matter, I would advise against messing around too much with a ratio of acid and sugar because both of these are key elements to making sure the food is preserved properly and the quality and consistency of that jam like jelly texture is correct. And so I've included a link in the bottom if you're watching your sugar um, watching out for your sugar intake. There are some low sugar jelly recipes that you can do, um, that you can try. But if you're gonna follow a jam recipe and especially the recipe we've provided for you here, we will recommend against limiting, um, against removing sugar from the recipe. Um, so without further ado, we're gonna show our little demonstration. And yes, the links are in the PDF. Sorry, one second. Uh, Katie, do you mind just restarting the video? <laughs> yes, for sure. Okay, so the first step is to uh, process all your fruit. So cut, uh, peel them and then cut them, your apples, your pears and plums into small cubes. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of fruit to get through. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big process. So this is a great chance to get friends and family involved. Make a little assembly line. You know, maybe for an example, maybe you can get your grandchildren to do the peeling and then maybe uh, you or someone else would do the cutting. And so, yep, we're chopping away. And then, we're, and then um, we're gonna zest the lemon and juice it. And that's all gonna go into this big saucepan. We're gonna add water just to the surface and then let it simmer for 30 minutes. And then that's when we put in the sugar and we're gonna stir that in. And then we're gonna raise it to a vigorous boil for 15 minutes and let the sugar do its thing. So while that happens, this is a good um, chance to start sanitizing the equipment and getting everything ready for the canning process. And so just place your jars in boiling water and boil them to sanitize for at least 10 minutes. And so in that time, the jelly is done. You can see this is that gel-like consistency. And so you can turn off the heat and there's a good chance to activate um, the snap lids by boiling them for five minutes. And then you wanna take out all your sanitized equipment very carefully, place them on a clean towel. And then you're gonna fill your hot jars with the hot jam and make sure you leave a quarter inch head space. After which you can place your snap lids on top and then screw them shut with a, with a screw band to fingertip tightness. 
sorry, the video seems a bit laggy. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you'll be able to watch this at home and it'll be a lot more smooth. Um, and then you can, you can put them back in the boiling water um, and, and, and start the canning process. So after 10 minutes, they're ready to go. You can remove them carefully from the water and you're gonna let them cool down. After they're cooled, you can check for um, the proper seal, if the proper seal is formed. And always uh, remember to label your canned foods um, with a name and date before you store them away. Okay, and I see some comments about storage and let's get to that part right now, sorry. Okay, so now we have made the jam, we need to know how to store the jam. Properly canned jam can be stored at a cool, dark, dry place for up to a year. And when it's open, the jam can stay in the fridge for up to a month. And when you are taking out a spoonful of jam, you need to always use a clean spoon to avoid contamination. And the same applies to the sauerkraut. You don't want to introduce bacteria into the jars. And discard any jar of jam that has mold growing on the top and in doubt, just throw them out. And jam can be frozen for around six months in a rigid big glass jar. The jam must be cooled to room temperature before freezing or it might crack. We also need to leave some room for, exp uh, for expansion. So while you are filling the jar, make sure you leave an inch of extra space. It will let your jam have the space to expand upon freezing. And before freezing, think about how much jam you will use in one go and freeze it in portions of this side to avoid waste in the future. And just now, I think there was an audience that was talking about jellies, like in the link before, like this is a low jelly recipe and gelatin was involved. And because we were using gelatin, we cannot freeze it and it cannot go through the water canning process. And that's why the shelf life of the jelly is only one week and it needs to be stored in the fridge. Okay, let's go back. And um, here are some, some ways to use your jams, except for spreading the jam on a piece of bread. You can also put it on top of the plain yogurt. So this is the DIY food flavor yogurt. It's gonna taste so good and it's a perfect snack. We can also make a breakfast bar. This recipe is in the link below and it's a really basic recipe. After pacifying the oats, you can add nut butter, baking powder, cinnamon, and mix to form a dough, and then just form a layer on the baking sheet. And you can spread your beautiful jam and add the remaining batter over the jam, and then we bake those. And there you go, voila, you have our delicious and healthy breakfast bar with the jam. And also you can add it to a salad dressing to balance the flavor with vinaigrette. So it's both sweet and sour. We can also make a jam topping on the cake and imagine your Christmas cake can have this beautiful fruit color of the autumn and you can spread the jam on the holiday cookies to make the jam and cookies attractive your kids. And just like what Tim said, you can use smaller jars to store the jam so that there are more servings. And those are great gifts to give when you are going to someone's house, when you are visiting your friends, and when you tell them, I myself made the jam for you, they can definitely feel your sincerity. Okay. And then here's the comparison between the homemade jam and the commercial one. So first thing first, check the serving size. There's one table of uh, one table table of jam for both, and let's see if the numbers below are the same. They are quite similar again. And this time, what stands out this time is the sugar contents. So we did add like five five cups of sugar to the jam, and this is because sugar has the preservative effect. And as I said before. Um, gelatin are often involved in the low sugar food recipe. Um, low sugar food can be easily and safely preserved as well, but the color, texture, and flavor might be different than what we would expect, and they might be less acceptable. And just because of the gelatin, the shelf life of those low sugar foods could be a bit shorter. Okay. 
I saw a comment in chat. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see the breakfast bar recipe in the PDF. So it's in the PowerPoint. The PowerPoint will also be emailed to you and uh, it's, it's gonna be there um, on the slide with uh, the picture of the, the, bar, the breakfast bars. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we are experts in sauerkraut and jam. Let's get to the next technique, drying. So here you can see this is the machine. It is the dehydrator. Compared to other methods of drying, it produces the best quality products. Most food dehydrators have an electronic element for heat and a fan and vents for air circulation. Efficient dehydrators are designed to dry food uniformly and to retain food quality. And then we can see this is an oven. Um, oven drying. An oven usually takes two to three times longer to dry food than a dehydrator. It's slower because ovens do not have the built-in fans for the air movement. And to use your oven for drying, you need to check the oven dial to see if there's a reading as low as 140 Fahrenheit, degrees Fahrenheit. And this is the keep warm setting. So if the thermostat does not go this low, your food will be cooked instead of being dried. And then there's sun drying and air drying. Those two techniques are not recommended in Canada. Uh, there is not much exposure to sunlight. The environment should be uh, should be dry to achieve sun drying. And as you can tell from the weather this week, this is not appropriate at all. Sun drying requires constant exposure to direct sunlight during the day and a relative humidity of less than 20%. Um, food dries in the sun can take like three to four days. And if the humidity is high, the food will mold before it gets dried. And air drying differs from sun drying because it takes place indoors in a well-ventilated attic, room, or screen in porch. So herbs, hot peppers, and mushrooms are the most common air dried items. And herbs and peppers are not protruded, but they're simply stand on a string and tied in bundles and just spend it until dry. They are often enclosed in paper bags to protect them from dust or other pollutants. Okay. Now we know about drying, let's start to do the apple recipe, uh, apple chips recipe. And the pillar here is actually optional. You can choose to keep the skin or not. The cutting board and knife are to slice the apples. And if you have a mandolin slicer, it's even better because it produces apple slices with consistent thickness. And it doesn't matter what kinds of apple you would use. If you prefer the sharp tart flavor, you can go for Granny Smith. And if you prefer sweet flavor, you can go for Honey Crisp, Gala, Fuji, Golden Apple, uh, Golden Delicious, et cetera. So any kinds of apple can be used for apple chips. So now let's watch the demonstration. So first preheat the oven to 230 degrees Fahrenheit and uh, cut the apples. The thickness is about one quarter to half inch thick. And this step is optional. You can coat it with whatever spices you prefer. And you, are, you want to make sure the apple chips and chips are coated evenly and lay them down on the parchment paper. And then we would bake them in the oven for 30 minutes. And after the 30 minutes, we would flip them and return them in the oven for another 30 minutes. And afterwards, we would just turn off the oven and let it sit in the oven for another hour. And voila, our apple chips are ready to be served. Super simple recipe. <laughs> okay, now let's check out the difference between our homemade apple chips and the commercial ones. So first thing first, same serving size. So the commercial product has more sugar in them, as you can see here, it's 21 grams, well, or homemade apple chips has 18 grams of sugar, which is the sugar that is naturally present in the apple. And as you can see, it's also a source of vitamin C and fiber. Mm -hmm. So the commercial apple chips are way more expensive than our homemade chips. I got the 
51 cents this price from the apples online, but you can always visit the local farmer's market to check out if apples are on sale. It could even cost you less. You can choose the ugly apples, the ones with broad skin and weird shapes. They won't make a difference in the oven. If anything, they save you more money. And um, here are some tips for storage. Well, before you continue, there's a question for you in the chat. Okay. Mike asked, what do you think about drying small quantities in the microwave? Since you're the drying expert, I thought I'd leave <laughs> that one to you. Yeah, microwave drying is also a method, but when using the microwave, sometimes the food tastes like it's being cooked rather than being dried. So this method is not really recommended, but microwave drying can also be used for some herbs. Um, so you would put them in the microwave to look, uh, for like two to three minutes, and then just check out if they are dried or brittle. And if not, return them in the microwave for another 30 seconds and repeat this process if it's not dried. But like in general, microwave oven is not, uh, microwave drying is not as efficient as the oven. I got another question. Could one dry shrimp at home to use in Asian recipes that call for dried shrimp? I don't know if you read something about um, the in the USDA um, recommendations. Do they have recommendations for shrimp as well? Okay, Katie? well, well, <laughs> I'll, well, check out the resources at the end for that question. I'm not too sure. <laughs> yeah, for that one, I'm not too sure. I'm pretty sure there's like a specific process that you would have to follow. It's definitely much more of a complicated thing to dry, especially because you have probably have to remove the the insides of the shrimp as well, or or something like that. So. And it's also going to require adding a quite a bit of salt as well. So you have to be really careful because there certainly can be some uh, food safety risks and food, food burn illness risks. So there are yeah. some, some recommendations for it, but it's, it's brining and, and drying and stuff, I believe. Yeah, so it's a much more involved process compared to just simple apple chips, for sure. Yep, let's, uh, so here are some tips for the storage. Uh, you can store the apple chips in an air uh, airtight container, and the apple chips can be kept for up to a week. So remember to share them with your family and friends. You can also freeze them for um, around six months. And if you have a dehydrator at home, you can pre-treat your apples with uh, acidic water and dry them with a food dehydrator. The shelf life is six months if properly stored. And if you don't have a dehydrator and if you don't want to freeze it, the apple chips had better to be finished in a week. And there are some ways to eat them up. You can have them in a bowl just like chips. You can also add them in the overnight oats, just like what you would do with raw apples. You can have them in the salad as well. The recipe to the chicken, spinach, feta cheese, and apple, cheese, uh, apple chips recipe is also down below. And you can have it in the yogurt dip to add more protein to your snacks. And also you can have them in the bakbe. So with plain yogurt, granola, and maybe some jam from the last demonstration, and we top it with some nuts and apple chips, the bakbe is bakbe. Um, I got another question. If you freeze apple chips, are they not soggy when they defrost? It, I, I would say it depends on the dryness of the apple chips. You need to make sure the apples are really dried when it comes out of the oven. And if it's not dry enough, make, make sure to let it stay in the oven for longer and check them out con uh, consistently. Yeah, the more water that's left over in your apple chips, then when you thaw it from the freezer, the soggier it's gonna get when, that, mm -hmm. when, the, when those little ice crystals start to, to melt and go back into water state. Yep, and as Mary said, you can redry them in the oven to crisp up the apple chips as well. Okay, so except for apple chips, what else do you think that can be dried? Type out your answer in the chat box, please. I mean, okay, so we got herbs, yes. Mushrooms, mm -hmm. mushrooms, kale, kale, like kale chips. That's great. It could be mm -hmm. a nice little snack. Although yeah. they won't keep the same way that apple chips keep. They they'll get soggy by the next day, but definitely enjoyable, fresh out of the oven. Mm -hmm. And you might need to add some oil to it to prevent it from burning. 
All right, so some excellent ideas. Okay, so we have a list here. Like we can try a lot of fruits like apricots, bananas, berries, cherries, and also the vegetables as well as like asparagus, beans, beets, okra, and onions. And you can check out the National Center for Home, uh, home Food Preservation because it has other techniques, examples, for safety and demonstration for all of all kinds of uh, food preservation, not just for drying. Okay. So we really hope you can retain some of the information from the workshop. So in the end, we'll ask you the most important question. What do you think you need to be careful of when preserving food? You can open up your mic and speak up. And I actually got a question. Are all fruits dried the same way? Um, so no, that's why we have, you have to refer to that resource that Katie just talked about because all of them will dry a little bit differently. But the, the general principle remains the same when, when, when drying the fruit. Will mm -hmm. the resource be put in the PDF that we get? Yes, yes. we will get it. But maybe I can link it um, in the chat box right now while I'm at it. One second. There you go. So that website will, will have details on how to dry diff, all sorts of different kinds of foods and also different um, food preservation techniques are covered there like canning, for example. We have another question. Are banana chips you buy actually deep fried? I'm not sure, but I know a lot of dried fruits, for example, like cranberries, um, they also add some extra oil after they dried it as an additional preservative kind of measure. And it makes it, gives it a nice gloss. It makes it look appealing as well. I don't know if Mary had anything to add to that. She's unmuted herself. So yeah, so for the, the banana, there are dehydrated bananas that you can buy in the store. Just look and see what's been added to them. Sometimes they're adding sugar and all those kinds of things to preserve them longer. And as far mm -hmm. as like the chips, like plantain chips, they are fried and you'll see either added oil or added sugar, depending on if they're dried or if they're fried to take a look at. Mm -hmm. So be sure to check out the ingredient list as well. Okay, so I have in the chat um, the answer to a question like stereo follow instructions and not adapt sugars, etc. Yeah, for the jams, exactly. And another question I have some homemade jam over two years old and the seals are secure. Is the risk one of the bacterial safety or just texture? I'm actually not too sure about that. I definitely the texture and the quality of food is affected. Um, as for if it's actually a risk of contamination, I don't know if Mary, you have uh, some input about that. I'm not too sure actually. So technically the canning places, whenever you're doing home canning, recommend that you use the product within a year. So um, that, those are kind of the food safety recommendations. So I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> okay, thank you for your participation in your preservation workshop.